he has experienced the game of hockey from just about every angle. Player, coach, scout, and front office executive. On this edition of Inside the Lightning, associate coach Craig Ramsey talks about his all-star career with the Buffalo Sabres, the importance of his relationship with the late Roger Nielsen, and the rush of emotions he felt when he finally realized a lifelong dream to raise Lord Stanley's Cup. Not a big practice guy in hockey, but golf, yes. Look at that. He shoots, he scores. Get in the short grass for a change. 275 right down the middle, <laughs> Rammer. I'll catch you. Get on it. Ooh, Rammer, that, did that go in the cup? I hope so, but I don't know. I doubt it. That That's was, beautiful. That Greg. was lucky again. If a person is any good, he, he should make that. So that puts a little pressure on you. I understand. That's the way we like it. All day long. Oh, I could do that. I like that. I'm just past the lagoon over by the cypress, so. But with any luck and a bridge, we can get <laughs> it's, it. I think it's in the leather. There, Craig. <laughs> hey, you know, when we were out there, you, you pointed out the condo before we started uh, taping here that you brought the Stanley Cup to. What did it feel after so much has been made about Dave Anderchuk raising the Stanley Cup, but for you, that was 33 years of professional hockey before you had that opportunity? Yeah. What I, was that moment? Oh, it was spectacular. It really was. Uh, one of the questions that was asked a lot after to everyone including me was you know has it sunk in how long did it take and I said well wait a sec when the buzzer went I knew I didn't have to think about it I didn't wonder what it was going to feel like it was wonderful it was great I, I mean this was a huge for me uh, a sense of relief um, we're thrilled for the team and for the people of Tampa that you know, we finally we brought this thing here you know, but for me after all this time it truly was a, a big <laughs> it's over and, and we got this thing done uh, when I got to finally pick up the cup and I, I think I let out a big whoop picked it up and got it over my head and hurt my shoulder <laughs> did you really <laughs> yeah well, I'm kidding I'm, I'm, a I'm a little beat up so I got it's so long it's not that it's heavy but it's long I got it up there my, my right shoulder oh so I did one quick spin and I looked and I found Jeff Reese I said hey Reese <laughs> <laughs> I gave him the trophy. <laughs> the world's watching. I finally waited. And uh, I, I got a phone call from uh, a couple of different friends who said, what happened? I said, well, I hurt my shoulder. <laughs> do you think about the guys in, the, in that flash of a moment when it's coming to, do you think about the, the guys you skated with in Buffalo or your junior teammates? The Danny Gares, that he was here for a while, the great 50 goal scorer. Was there a flash, a rush of faces, names, coaches from years gone by? There certainly was after. Uh, and when I picked that up, um, so many things go through your head right away. I, how lucky I was originally. I, I, my first thought was that I had three of my boys, my three boys here, and my wife, and, and 30 odd people. Uh, my only, my daughter couldn't make it. She had school, too much school, but I, I knew they were there. They were, they were watching it. My wife had waited all this time with me. I've known her since I was 17, so uh, she put in a lot of time to get us here. Um, for me, with some medical problems in the past, you know, to have this opportunity was so special. And then I, I certainly was thinking of the guys back home, uh, back in Buffalo, that. Uh, put in so many years and we had such a good team for a long period of time and we just couldn't get it done and this team these these young people had just come together and worked so hard and, and led by the Andrew Chucks and the Taylors it was really a, a very emotional moment how far did this organization have to come when you first got here <laughs> what, what you inherited and then to that moment of winning the Stanley Cup here uh, why did you come here and what did you see the challenge when you got here that all that needed to be fixed in so many areas well originally I was talking to uh, I talked to Rick Dudley he called me when I was uh, let go in Philadelphia 
and we were talking about his team and shortly well not shortly but after that uh, he had to let his coach go and we we got talking uh, about Tampa and would I be interested um, I said well I, I believe I would but you know you have to talk to John and then that gives me some time to think about it and uh, a couple of days later John Tortorella called me I knew John Tortorella from his days coaching in Buffalo mm -hmm. uh, with Rick Dudley in the organization and uh, I had a lot of respect for John and he wanted to find out I guess a little bit about where I was and where I was coming from and we had a couple of long conversations on the telephone and I said yes I would I would do that the quality of talent that seemed to put you over the top, the Nikolai Hobby Bullens. You've mentioned the Dave Anderchuk, but also players like Corey Sarich. I'll all forever link Corey Sarich to that Philadelphia series. Uh, but can you talk about that premier talent as well as role players who were so vitally important to this team? Well, there's so many players that are important when you look at it, because you don't win without everybody. I mean, and I mean everybody. Um, when you, uh, when I came here, the team was a bit disorganized, and the on-ice product, and John had some really strong ideas on where he wanted to go with his hockey team. And we, we spent some time trying to work out a plan between the two of us so that he could get his, his things accomplished and I could put in, have my input, and, and get the people going in the direction I felt was important. But we knew, looking at the team, that there was some talent there. The, Brad Richards and Cavalier and St. Louis, Freddie Modine, we knew that was there, and then we picked up Vinnie Prospo. We started to put it, and you get a Nikolai Heavy Bull, and suddenly now, even though you're not winning, uh, you're looking at having this opportunity to win. Corey Saric was an unproven kid coming out of Buffalo. But we had all these people, and could we put them together? We, we came up with a plan that we thought would work. It took us quite a while to get it in place, and we went after them, and we pushed them, and we pushed them. And then you saw these guys coming along. The addition of the Chris Dingman, I, I think of uh, what Dish brings to the plate, holding onto the puck, killing time late in the game. The fact that you can play our, our fourth-line players, if you want to look at it that way, and at any time of the game, against anybody. This is when you really start to have a hockey team. All right, so after that birdie on the previous hole, Craig, what people might not realize, in addition to your professional golfing career, you also, <laughs> played, you also played 14 years in the National Hockey League. This will be the 20th anniversary season of winning the Selkie Award as the best defensive forward in the National Hockey League. Would that be, in your mind's eye, the most proud moment of your career, the proudest season to accomplish that? Well, I think winning a... a a league award like that is a special event. Um, reality was I probably wasn't quite as good that year as I had been in previous really? years. I think that uh, they probably recognized I was getting late in my career and wanted to make sure I won it once. Uh, I was second a number of times. And Bob Gainey Bob was Gainey annually with first Montreal winning it, that. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I felt um, that I deserved to win it. Uh, you know, I was, I, I just really wanted to win that trophy. And when it first came out, I thought, this is great. They've finally established a trophy to recognize someone who, who participates in both ends of the rink and, and make it uh, a proud point for those of us who did that job. So I thought the couple of years I could have won it, I scored 20 some goals. I was a big plus. We had a great team and it didn't happen. And then all of a sudden, I, I I was off the list for a couple of years, and then bang, I was back up, and they and they gave me that. Unfortunately, and foolishly, in retrospect, I decided to retire and start coaching. <laughs> uh, very foolish move. The only person who really thought I should just keep on playing was my wife. She thought that would be great, uh, but I, I walked away healthy and happy, and I had a job that I to go to. You played with the French Connection, one of the most famous lines in the history of, of sport, yet your line, a checking line behind them, was really effective, and I know you took a great deal of pride in that. And then there's Perot yeah. and Gilbert and, and all the glitter and glitz of that, you and Danny Guerin. Who was the third member of that Don Luce, line? Don Luce, and uh, Danny joined us. His first season, I think, was 74-75. And uh, he scored a goal 18 seconds into his first game, banging in a second rebound off a play from Donnie. And 
we knew we had a, a guy to play with. And we went on that year, and, and I think we scored 99 goals as a line. Uh, the connection had 100, and we had 99. And we were the quote unquote checking line. The checking line. line. Uh, Donnie and I killed all the penalties. Danny never got to kill penalties. He was uh, on the second power play at best. And he, this kid came along the next year and topped that and scored 50 goals. And that is, in, in my mind, the most underrated achievement that I've ever seen. A guy scores 50 goals on the checking line. And it's almost unrecognized. And I think that's a real shame for the league that. Uh, you look around now, and you certainly are not going to find a checking line that has 50 goals, let alone checking line that, with a 50-goal scorer on You talk about getting into coaching. One of the more remarkable achievements, I think, comes when you join Roger Nielsen in South Florida. And in the first couple of years of the expansion Florida Panthers, you're in the Stanley Cup Finals or headed that way the organization is. Can you talk about Roger? And, and what made him such a special individual and why those early Panther teams that you were a part of were so competitive? Well, Roger was the guy, I met Roger, actually I, I first saw Roger when I was 14, he coached against me and I just thought he was a, a pain in the neck. Uh, he had, his teams were so well coached and he drove us crazy for two years. Then he drafted me to go to Peterborough and play junior for him. So I started playing for him at 16, played four years, and we used to have such great times sitting and talking on the bus and talking about the game and talking about what we could do as a team. He actually, I coached a game in junior hockey plan for Roger. He got suspended because this guy hurt me and uh, I couldn't play. So I, he said, you coach the team, you know, as well as I do. So uh, this is really a special man. He was great with kids. He was great with people. He wanted to make you a better person on top of being a better hockey player. Uh, when he called me, I, I'd been in Buffalo for 22 years, and he called me on a Sunday night, and he said, yeah, Remmer, I got the job in Florida. If you want it, you want to come, it's yours. <laughs> That's so, the interview. Uh, that was the interview. So uh, the next day, my wife and I decided to make the move to down in South Florida. After spending 22 years in Buffalo as a player coach and in the front office, Ramsey decided to reunite with longtime friend and mentor Roger Nielsen in South Florida in 1993, as the Panthers were getting set for their inaugural season. We were involved uh, with Bob Clark and a number of other people, including Billy Barber, uh, in picking that first team. So we went with character. We wanted some talent, but we wanted character. We wanted people who were committed, who knew the game, and who we knew we could count on. So we did, we checked hard into their backgrounds, trying to find out who they were as people. And that's what really made the difference. Here we went to this team, and they were brand new together. Everything was, uh, everything was new. Uh, the organization did a good job in making it a first-class organization, but we had these great people like a Brian Scruton, uh, a Jody Hall. Uh, and, uh, Scott Mellonby was on that team. Scotty Mellonby, who's still playing now, and Joe Sorella, uh, Keith Brown, uh, Van Duesbrook and Matt. Um, Gordy Murphy. We had so many kids that were high quality people and then everybody else just sort of fit in. Roger and I uh, coached that team along with Lindy Ruff. We brought Lindy in his first year of retirement and we missed the playoffs by one point. And this is... Uh, in know, the expansion in year. In the expansion year. The, the best expansion franchise in history of any sport. Uh, one point. We did it again the next year at one point. And then we got the phone call saying thank you very much but you're out. And Roger and I were both fired. Um, a new person came in and a new person wanted their own man. And this is one of the re really heartbreaking moments in the, both of our lives that we built this team and now we were so close. We really liked this team and then we were gone. Uh, so that, that was pretty disheartening. One of the quotes to Roger from the president of the team uh, was that he, we won too many games and we were screwing up their draft position. So strange way to look at it. I never been fired for winning too much. Were you only when you've seen the lowest lows can you appreciate the mountaintop. But I mean, you, you've seen some bitter moments. When Roger began to get sick and you're in Philadelphia, you had to coach that team to the Eastern Conference Finals. Roger is now facing his gravest challenge, and, and here you are, your emotions and memories of that. When he first called me in and said, hey, uh, we got to talk about something, I've got cancer and I'm going to have to get treatment, and I, oh man, you got this can't be. Uh, he, he was such a workout guy, always busy, always doing something. Rode his bike all the time. Uh, all the time, even in the winter in, in uh, New Jersey, he was riding his bicycle. And um, 
now he was he was sick and he said I'm going to coach right up until the day I go in and then you're going to take over I mean that was hard uh, to take over from him and Wayne Cashman was there to help me out. We brought in Mike Stuthers, and we were three points from not making the playoffs because the players had taken a hit over this too. You know what was going to happen to Roger, and they were concerned. And we had some good meetings, and we turned this thing around. We ended up finishing first place. We beat the Rangers last game of the season to finish first. And uh, don't you just hate that? We went to game. <laughs> we went to game seven against New Jersey, and we lost with two minutes to go. Uh, in game seven of that series and I think the hardest part for me was the fact that I, I got a lot of abuse in the media for um, uh, coaching the team when Roger uh, finished his treatments and was wanted to come back was thought he was ready to come back the doctors didn't think so and he really wasn't well, we didn't think he was quite ready so we got him back as an assistant to me and I, I was abused for I guess doing too good a job. It was really a tough thing because Roger backed me to the hilt. I mean, he was uh, very, very supportive. He did anything I asked. He, he was on, he was with me, and we we never had a fight, never talked about it. It was never an issue with us, but it became a media issue. You're a sensitive guy, Greg. You know, I, and that and this will sound silly, but you are. I, as, as strong and as tough as you are, I, there's a sensitivity to you. Well. I just think that uh, I said to somebody, do you think I would have done a better job for my friend Roger if I'd have done a bad job? And the fact that I did a good job because I've been trained by a great person. Right. This is all positive things and uh, you know, it, it's just one of those things that you look back on and uh, it was hard to get through. Uh, but we had a we had a great run and I think for me it was a great learning experience coming this year when we had that chance again. You have a chance here. I'm looking at a, a par three. The water cuts in front of this magnificent hole here, Craig. What's your confidence level on this, Rammer? High. <laughs> really high. Here you go, buddy. Cold, but really high. <laughs> well, take a few warm-up swings. Well, I said practice is overrated. All right, Craig, all the sunshine. Let's all the beautiful in. fairway. That's a nice, easy hole. What would this be about hole. the uh, four handicap hole on this? <laughs> Something like that. It certainly feels like it. Look at this. Turn one time. Uh, sit down. Don't go in there. Did you Ouch. make it? Make that trap? I believe so. If you want to just hold that for a second. Here, can I show this to the camera here? This. Mongolian grip on that putter right there. It's the famed Mongolian grip. Yeah, big hands. Inside big the cup here for a quarter, Rammer. All right. Hit a house. Oh. That's, that's You've left easy the door. To beat. You've left the door open, that's Mr. Ramsey. Easy to beat. Rammer. I pulled mine. <laughs> he shoots. He shoots, he doesn't score. He scores. I got it. Robert, you talk about the great players. If there is a player that I identify you with this season, it'd be Brad Richards. And I know you spent a lot of time with him during the course of the season here. It, it appeared you had um, quite a relationship, coach, player. He He's one of the guys who really wants to be better all the time. He has continued from the day I got here to ask questions. Uh, to try and extend himself. And I think Brad always felt he had something to prove. Another smaller player, uh, highly skilled, coming over the Quebec League. Um, he really wants to prove that he's a top player, not just somebody else that plays. Um, and, you know, for an him, elite player. An elite player. He won the Conn Smythe Award, the playoff MVP. And I, I suspect that makes him pretty elite. And, you know, he came in. Sort of uh, a bit on Vinny's coattails, having played with him. Sure. And, you know, Vinny is the star, and Richie's going to be the guy that comes along and helps him. And I think that uh, that they're handling this very well. That they're using it to push each other. They one does a has a good game, has a good stretch. The other guy wants to catch him. It's not a jealousy thing. It's something where they push each other and they continue to get better. And I think we saw great strides from Vinny this year. 
And of course, for Mitchie, as he just kept on going, and the playoff they had, that ability to score those playoff goals, winning goals, is spectacular. This is one of the most highly decorated teams in the history of the National Hockey League, and that includes the Jack Adams Award winner, the Coach of the Year, in John Tortorella, who you knew when he first came into this league at, over a decade ago as an assistant coach. You would have a unique perspective of his transformation. Well, he came in uh, out of, well, originally in uh, the East Coast League, I think he started his coaching, and then went to the American League with Rick Dudley, came to Buffalo with Rick Dudley. Uh, John was a guy, he used to sneak up to my office because uh, I, I was the odd man out in that little operation. Uh, he, he wasn't supposed to talk to me with uh, John Muckler, but uh, he would come in and we would talk about penalty killing. We would talk about uh, the uniqueness of having to play in that Buffalo odd in a smaller building. John wanted to be better. He wanted to learn the game and he continues to strive to, to adjust his game to be a better coach all the time. He's looking for something that makes him better and then passing that information on. So I knew John. I knew his level of intensity from his days in Rochester where we had some incidents. Uh, he, he wants to win and he demands that the players participate at that level with him. So I knew coming in that my role here would be a lot about working with John and, and maybe in some ways getting him to slow down a little bit and allow his philosophies to, to flourish and, and not let his intensity get the better of him. And I think he's made a wonderful transformation in that he can bring the intensity, but when it's time to be calm and be cool, he brings that with him as well. I see a lot of Vince Lombardi in uh, John Tortorella. People might uh, question that, but there there is that uh desire to be a perfectionist. In your mind's eye, years from now, how do you want people to have remembered Craig Ramsey? Well, I would like the, the players to believe that uh, they got better playing with me, the people that are around me. I'd like them to think that they understand the game a little bit better having had me here, but the thing that I really want is that for my players to believe that uh, they're not just better hockey players, but better people. That, They've learned more than just hockey. They've learned some life skills to go along with it. And I believe that that's what makes our team special. And that's what I feel is, uh, has been my role and what I want to be known as. Am I the worst golfer you've ever known? Absolutely not. I think you've got a great swing and you're almost there. Thanks, Coach. Craig, thank you, buddy. Thank you.